In L.A. this week, the LADWP loses a legal battle after a state appeals court gives the city controller the green light to examine two controversial trusts. The story coming up. It's about, you know, saying, I, I love doing this. I'm not going to wait for someone to tell me that I, I can do it. This women and media event at Getty House showcases some of the top female movers and shakers in the digital age. I'm Anna Marcos, and we'll have more on that coming up. And a program that gets students on the road to success rolls into town next. Hello and welcome to LA This Week. Thanks for joining us. I'm Yana Kay. Our top story, a landmark ruling is expected to provide more transparency at a pair of mysterious Department of Water and Power nonprofits. The trusts receive millions of dollars in ratepayer money annually, but according to a recent audit, with little or no explanation for lavish spending. Gil Reyes reports. Opening the books was like pulling teeth. After a bitter two-year battle, City Controller Ron Galperin finally got a brief glimpse at the spending habits of two mysterious DWP nonprofits earlier this year. And now a state appeals court has ruled it shouldn't be a struggle next time, that Galperin can look anytime he wants. Affirming my authority as controller to audit these two DWP trusts and to bring transparency to the people of Los Angeles. The city's top three elected officials praised the Second District Court of Appeals decision. Judges rejected claims that transactions of the two nonprofits were private. The utilities joint training and joint safety institutes have collected $40 million in ratepayer money. That's our money for more than a decade with little or no transparency. The ratepayers of the city of Los Angeles are entitled to know how their hard-earned money is spent. City officials bargained with the DWP union to open a portion of the books covering five years of expenditures last spring. The results weren't pretty. Galperin found, quote, questionable spending on administrator salaries, gas, expensive steak dinners, and lavish hotel stays. Clearly those audits prove that there was money misspent at those trusts. But all of that spending was uncovered only because we fought collectively. We have to ask ourselves, have these trusts been living up to their stated purposes? And is it time to bring them to a conclusion? Now, before the court's ruling, city officials had recommended a broad series of reforms for the two nonprofits. Officials say an upcoming progress report from the utility will help them decide what to do next. Outside DWP headquarters, Gil Reyes for LA This Week. One recommendation is to merge the two nonprofits into one group to save money. As of deadline time for this story, no comment from the DWP's union. While well, the 20th National Day of Protest to stop police brutality has now expanded across the nation into a larger Rise Up event, as more communities speak out against the increasing number of officer-involved shootings and killings. Anna Marcos takes us to the L.A. rally at LAPD headquarters. LA demonstrators helped kick off three days of protest for the Rise Up October movement to stop police terror, especially in communities of color. The father of Joanna Flores was allegedly killed by law officers after she called them for help. He was having a mental breakdown. That's what you're trained to do, not to kill people. Now they're just killing everybody because they feel threatened. There is tasers, guns that you can use. You can use so many stuff to protect themselves, but now they're just shooting. The policing is done differently in colors of poverty, in communities of poverty, communities of color than it is done in, in, in white communities. The protesters here are relatives and friends of those killed by L.A. and San Bernardino Sheriff's deputies and by Inglewood police. My son, Kevin, was shot and killed in 2008 uh, by an Inglewood cop. 45 days prior to him killing my son, he shot and killed another African-American young man. And, you know, I'm here to, 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 to speak for my brother because he can't speak no more. What brought me here is the uh, extermination of a generation of our youth. But not everyone here rallied against police brutality. 
It's not the police officer's fault that black Americans and Hispanics are going out and committing crimes. We pay the police officer to protect the innocent. But guilt and innocence, it seems, depends on who is doing the judging. These are people that have done things that are wrong. They're in situations they shouldn't be in. But nevertheless, the police did not have the right to make, to be judge and jury and executioner. It's an often violent and contentious standoff. But this rally ended peacefully this time. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. About 30 U.S. cities took part in Rise Up October. While a happy homecoming for former Valley Boy and now L.A. Mayor Eric Garcetti, the mayor received a warm reception at his yearly luncheon with San Fernando Valley business leaders. But as Gil Reyes reports, the vibe was much different hours earlier in another part of town. Less than 24 hours after a combative town hall meeting in South L.A., Mayor Eric Garcetti ventured to Woodland Hills and got a totally different reception. I love coming here. I love coming back to the valley that I was born and raised in. Garcetti received a double standing ovation at this annual mayor's luncheon at the Warner Center Marriott, the event hosted by the United Chambers of Commerce. Speaking to Valley business owners, the mayor recalled growing up like a typical Valley boy from Encino. Ventura Boulevard, take the RTD bus to school, stop at the Sherman Oaks Galleria as a young man, maybe spend a couple quarters in the arcade, watch movies come out that were, you know, Valley Girl and Fast Times, Ridgemont High. None of those are biographical of my experience, by the way. But. But no one was laughing the night before. Activists with the group Black Lives Matter shouted down, interrupted, and turned their backs on the mayor. They disapprove of his support of the LAPD after a number of police killings that demonstrators say were unjustified. Here at Warner Center, Garcetti touted his accomplishments to a much friendlier crowd, like 86,000 jobs added to the city since last year and billions of dollars set aside for new construction. We just had the village open up, which is a $350 million investment right here in the West Valley in the Warner Center area. That was also a partnership with the city. I think he's doing fabulous. He is so um, sensitive to the needs of military and veterans. The mayor says more needs to be done. Whether it's the work that we have to do to make sure that the prosperity that many of us are now feeling again is felt in all neighborhoods. Los Angeles steps up to its challenges. And the mayor says he will too. At Warner Center, Gil Reyes for LA This Week. The mayor also promised to bring more manufacturing and entertainment jobs back to LA. And supporting new jobs in the digital age, especially for women, was the focus at a recent Women in New Media event hosted by the mayor and First Lady. Anna Marcos shows us how some women are pushing new frontiers. An autumn wonderland greets visitors at Getty House as the Women in New Media event kicks off. Some of these women have helped build tech companies and startups and created new digital avenues for viewing web content, film, video and more in a city known to be the third largest tech hub in the nation and of course the number one entertainment hub in the world. It's about, you know, saying, I, I love doing this. I'm not going to wait for someone to tell me that I, I can do it. All these women embody the trending mantra in this digital age that all the new technologies give everyone a voice. You can go online, you can write your story, you can have a YouTube channel and suddenly, you know, have a huge audience. Everybody can have a phone and everybody can make stuff. For some, it's about creating media for whole new demographics like young U.S. born Hispanics who gobble up more digital media than anyone else but who often get ignored by content creators. You cannot afford to not be in business with Hispanics if you want to grow in anything you do in this country. These young girls are learning media production with the group Global Girl Media and they could be the new voices of tomorrow. They taught us how to edit, film and how to journal like writing blogs and stuff like that. It helped us actually find our voice and not be scared to, to use it to because we have to know that it's powerful. Garcetti's office also giving women more of a voice. It has appointed the first Latina chief of staff and more women to all boards and commissions as well as management positions. One of the challenges I've personally taken on is creating more meaningful leadership roles for women in the city of Los Angeles. It's critical that women and girls are fairly represented in our democracy. And there's a lot of power in this tent. 
There is tremendous power in this city and in this world, especially in the hands of our girls and our women. On this night, the hashtag women in new media is trending. With all that female power, we just might have to create a new hashtag out of an old standby that existed way back when there were no hashtags. You've come a long way, baby. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. The event was part of a Women in Leadership series started by the mayor and first lady at Getty House. Well, Los Angeles continues to expand on its cutting-edge technology, and now it's happening at the local bus stop. Rasha Goel has more. Believe it or not, waiting for the bus might be a good time to charge your phone. Mayor Eric Garcetti recently unveiled a smart shelter and the city's first ever smart bench. This smart shelter that we see behind us will include one, real-time information for when that next bus is coming. Um, you'll see it digitally and you can actually press a button to hear it too in case you have sight impairment as well. Second, free Wi-Fi. And who doesn't love free Wi-Fi? I'm sure some of you are connected already. Being able to know when that next bus is coming, surf the internet, check your email, talk to friends. And there's a USB charging port because we're always running down our batteries. It's all part of the mayor's Great Streets initiative to enhance the transit rider experience through interactivity and innovation. The bench, called a SUFA, comes with two USB ports which are powered by a solar panel. The new smart bench is located on the corner of 43rd Street and South Central Avenue in South LA's historic Central District. It is the first of 15 installations planned across the city. The SUFA bench is social, it's sustainable, and it's smart. And the thing that we're the most excited about is that it's social. So whenever you go out and you're in your city, um, you sit down on a bench and you start a little conversation. The SUFA benches were previously adopted in Boston in 2014. This is part and parcel of the kind of progress, the kind of innovation, uh, the kind of uh, collaboration we want to see. It's uh, a great idea to have Wi-Fi under um, a bus stop. So the next time you find yourself low on battery power, head on over to LA's newest tech hub and perhaps catch a ride while you're at it. I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. The remaining shelters and benches will be added to the streets of LA over the next nine months. More than 500 students in Watts just might have a firmer direction for future careers after a road trip nation stopped into town. Anna Marcos has more on a program that helps connect students with career dreams. Road Trip Nation is literally taking its show on the road. The program hooks up students with their interests and with possible career paths through interactive exercises and videos. The students also get mentors. Outside of just being an artist, you could be a manager, uh, you could work at a record label. I think that it's really helping us give us an opportunity to find what we want to do in our career. The program with its mobile bus is visiting 30 events around the country. First stop, the Alliance Cindy and Bill Simon Technology Academy High School in Watts. And it started off as a PBS documentary series, which is still in production, but that series developed into a classroom curriculum. We wanted to specifically support students who are unfortunately not getting enough funding, not getting enough support. Emmy-winning actor William Allen Young, who stars in a new CBS show called Code Black, has come to give Watts a little love and support as he talks about his character. Dr. Robert Guthrie is an ER trauma center doctor, a specialist, and a surgeon. And I wrote his backstory. CBS said, William, you create this character. So I said, well, then this character is from Watts. So when you watch the show, this character comes from Watts, he grew up in the Nickerson Garden housing project. That backstory taken straight from Alan's own life story. The clear message here that no matter where you come from, you have a right to do what you really want with your life. I'm thinking of photographer. Like traveling the world and taking pictures of nature and people and cultures like that. Armed with an interest, a plan and a goal, that photography career just might become more possible. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. A special group of police and firefighters are recognized for extraordinary service that oftentimes is taken for granted. Gil Reyes reports from the E for Excellence Awards in Granada Hills. A special honor for LA City Fire Department engineer Sean Williams. After 25 years saving people and mentoring youth, 
He's basking in the limelight, though reluctantly. If you know anything about the fire department, uh, we don't like the spotlight being on us. We like doing the work, being behind the scenes. So it's nice to be recognized once in a while. It just kind of gives you that little carrot to keep you going, the little spark that just keeps you going. Engineer Williams, one of several honorees here at the 2015 E for Excellence Awards at the Odyssey Restaurant in Granada Hills. This banquet honors those first responders who've gone above and beyond the call of duty. Certainly there's bad press out there and there's some things that happen, but at the end of the day, we've got tens of thousands of first responders here, including the County of Los Angeles, that go way above the call of duty to do so much. LA City Councilman Mitchell Englander, an LAPD reservist, emceed the sixth annual event honoring police and firefighters, like veteran fire captain Roger Fobble. Fobble is also a chaplain who comforts grieving firefighters on the front lines. Um, it's just been an honor and a privilege to be able to serve and give back to the members of this department in this capacity. LAPD officer Leslie Perez is honored for bravery in a deadly shootout. She says ceremonies like this make a difference with fellow officers. You know it does because we feel like we do get the bad rap, but when we get recognized for what we think is simply doing our job, although we are putting our lives on the line for the community, it feels good that we're actually being appreciated. Yes. It really takes somebody with a special calling to risk their life on behalf of others. The ceremony, a way of saying thanks. In Granada Hills, Gil Reyes for LA This Week. The ceremony honored 11 firefighters and police officers, also recognized the North Hollywood area narcotics enforcement detail. While gun owners face stricter storage laws, an annual tradition lights up City Hall, and a new pilot program aims to break ground on earthquake preparedness. All these stories and more in City Beat. The Los Angeles City Council voted unanimously to require that handguns be stored in locked containers or disabled with a trigger lock as a safeguard against the weapons harming children or other adults. Councilmember Paul Krikorian, who authored the measure, said the passage of the gun storage law is a basic common sense safety measure that even the National Rifle Association recommends. The only time a handgun does not need to be stored or locked is when it is carried on the body of or within the close proximity and control of the owner or another lawfully authorized person. LA City Council members reenacted the historic ringing of the rebellion bell that launched Mexico's independence war in 1810 as part of the El Grito celebration or Mexican Independence Day. With the steps of City Hall lit up in the colors of the Mexican flag, hundreds of folks came out for the festivities which featured live authentic entertainment and a variety of local flavors. And we have the Taste of Mexico, which basically was a concept that I came up with, which is a uh, regional food taste of the different regions, parts of Mexico, so that people can sample the delicious food or originally from Mexico. This is a, a very important cultural celebration in Los Angeles because of the huge contributions uh, from the Mexican-American community. Mayor Eric Garcetti announced that Eagle Rock High School will have the first classrooms in the country to pilot the United States Geological Survey's earthquake early warning system, ShakeAlert. A software application installed on classroom computers will give students access to the beta stage ShakeAlert system, which uses ground motion data from hundreds of seismic sensors across California, Oregon and Washington to deliver a few seconds or minutes of warning before seismic shaking hits. The ShakeAlert system's audio and visual alert will be used to initiate regular earthquake drop, cover and hold on drills in the classroom and will give faculty and students the opportunity to integrate live earthquake warnings into emergency response procedures. A workshop on using smartphones was held recently at the Centro Maravilla Community Center in Koreatown. The free two-hour workshops put on by AARP target senior citizens to help them get more comfortable using smartphone technology by providing step-by-step -step instructions from how to text, take and send pictures to looking things up on the internet. Beginner and more advanced workshops are also available. I actually don't know how to, how to work these phones and since it's very important to know how to uh, send photos or messages or texts. For the workshop schedule, visit aarptek.org. 
bringing communities together in Council District 10. That's what one LA City Council member is doing, one movie night at a time. Wearing a pink shirt to match her mom's, little Giselle is spending a warm summer evening with her family at Westside Neighborhood Park. They're getting ready to watch not one, but two movies under the stars. We're very happy to be here for this event where they will uh, be enjoying uh, with, our, with our community, a community event uh, and our neighbors. So we're looking forward to this event. It was the biggest gathering of the season for LA Council President Herb Wesson's Movies at the Park. Every summer, Wesson hosts four family-friendly movies in the park at different locations within the district. People enjoy coming out with their neighbors and uh, friends, and uh, it's a, a cheap night, but a fun night. Folks enjoyed an evening of burgers, hot dogs, popcorn, and candy. And to sweeten the deal even more was Wesson's raffle drawing, which gives away prizes like bicycles, skateboards, and headphones. On this night, one lucky winner took home a big screen TV. And for some kids, that beats watching a movie in the theater any day of the week. This is better because you get to pay less, or actually no money, and you get to win prizes that cost like a hundred and bucks and over. And they're for free. With a bright quarter moon shining overhead, nearly 1,500 children and their families came out for the movie night under the stars, providing a fun and safe environment for all ages. Since 1935, Clifton's Cafeteria has stood as a Los Angeles icon on Broadway, just north of 7th Street. Closed since 2010 for renovations, it's now returned to the Los Angeles scene. Rich Samuels has more. I think the best thing here was the way it made you feel when you came in. For 75 years, Clifton's Cafeteria stood as a true L.A. institution, drawing in the famous and not-so-famous into a virtual fantasy land of food. Then it went dark. But we don't come here today just to mark history. We come here today to make history. It took $10 million and five years to bring Clifton's back. Why so long? Current owner Andrew Myron recalls the singular vision of founder Clifford Clifton. He created this so that he wasn't just nourishing the, the body, he was nourishing the soul, the spirit, the imagination, creativity, innovation, and that spirit led to, instead of building a restaurant and building a community center, it was building the center of a community. And that's what took so long here, because I wanted to be true to that legacy. Not only restored, but renewed, Clifton's Cafeteria features five floors. The first floor cafeteria is open now. A tiki lounge, fine dining restaurant, bars and a ballroom are opening over the next few months. Over 250 jobs are being created. Everybody, no matter who you are, no matter what walk of life you're from, you have some connection to Clifton's. And reopening during downtown's dramatic rebirth, it seems that the new Clifton's will be touching lives for years to come. This is Rich Samuels for LA This Week. And yes, Clifton fans, fear not, the legendary Jello is back. While the LA Zoo just got a late fall addition to its animal family, a new baby giraffe is the latest birth to add to the bunch. Anna Marcos takes us to the giraffe exhibit at the zoo. He's only days old and already running like a pro. This little guy, born to a first-time mama giraffe named Zainabu, is so young he has no name yet. He's taking his first look around at the giraffe exhibit area that will soon be his home at the L.A. Zoo. Beautiful, beautiful animal. I mean, very impressive. So beautiful. He's very curious. He's out here checking out you know, every inch of his new surroundings, every rock and plant. If he gets uh, scared or something spooks him, he will run back to his mom and stay in the middle of the the herd where he feels safe and protected, just like they would do in the wild. This type of giraffe, the Maasai, is the tallest of all giraffes. And at six feet tall, the little baby has about 12 more feet to grow. They're the tallest land mammal. Males can grow up to 18 feet tall. At a year old, he can be up to 10 feet tall. So at that rate of growth, um, you could literally sit out here and watch the giraffes grow because the babies grow so fast. The birth is a welcome event among an animal population in which two subspecies are endangered. Giraffe populations are declining because of uh, poaching, uh, habitat loss, habitat destruction, uh, defragmentation, um, human encroachment, or you know, for their meat or for you know, trophy hunting, just to say I shot a giraffe. Zookeepers hope that the birth of babies like this help educate and make the public more aware that having creatures like this in the wild is all the trophy we need. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week.
Now, giraffes are herbivores. At the LA Zoo, they're fed tree branches, acacia and ficus leaves, hay, and a special animal protein. Well, get moving to the beat as a popular Latin jazz ensemble makes a rare appearance on the West Coast. Add a new four-legged member to your family during a pet adoption event and get some exercise while having fun at the same time. All this in this week's Things to Do. Arturo O'Farrell is a pianist and composer based in New York City. He's the son of pioneering Latin jazz musician Chico O'Farrell. When his father died in 2001, Arturo became band leader of the legendary Afro-Cuban Jazz Orchestra and took over the tradition of playing the New York City Jazz Institution Birdland each Sunday night. Soon thereafter, Wynton Marsalis offered O'Farrell the opportunity to form and lead an Afro-Cuban jazz band that would perform regularly at Lincoln Center. Arturo named the new band the Afro-Latin Jazz Orchestra and opted for a traditional jazz big band instrumentation with the addition of a three-piece Cuban percussion section. Now a well-oiled touring machine, the entire 17-piece band makes a rare appearance on the West Coast on Saturday, November 7th at UCLA's Royce Hall. Visit happenings.ucla.edu for more info. When this bell rings, the animal gets adopted. Adopt your new best friend at Best Friends NKLA Super Adoption. Meet over 1,000 dogs, cats, puppies, and kittens for adoption from more than 50 Los Angeles rescues and shelters. Adoption fees start as low as $50, including spaying, neutering, shots, and microchip. Plus, adopters receive a goodie bag with collars, leashes, treats, coupons, and other pet-related items. It's a cooperative effort in which shelters and rescue groups come together in a free, fun, festival-like atmosphere to find homes for hundreds of animals. Featuring food trucks and fun for the whole family, you can adopt a new best friend and help make LA a no-kill city. The event is usually held twice a year at the La Brea Tar Pits and Museum at 5801 Wilshire Boulevard. For more info, visit nkla.org slash events. Afro Funk Dance Fit is a fun and high energy dance workout for various levels. Beginners are welcomed. Ignited by African funk and Afro Caribbean beats like conga, soca, reggae, calypso, Latin funk, high life, and mocasa. This workout fuses traditional contemporary and stylized African Caribbean hip hop and funk dance movements into one dynamic fitness routine that feeds the mind, body, and spirit. Try something new, fun, cultural, and fit. Come on and get Afro Funky. The class takes place on Sunday, November 8th at the Heartbeat House Dance Studio located at 3141 Glendale Boulevard in LA. For more, visit MoveDanceLive.com. And that's a look at some things to do. Well, that's going to do it for this edition. I'm Yana Kay, and from all of us here at LA This Week, thanks for joining us. A reminder that you can catch us online at LACityView.org. You can also follow and like us on Facebook. We'll see you back here next week for more of L.A. This Week.